Welcome to FACTS webinar called Adventures in Farm Camps for Kids. Our presenters today are Samantha Gasson of Bull City Farm and Anna Skemp of Deep Roots Community Farm. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACTS Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating today's session. So before we dive into the presentation, I have just a few quick introductions. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, Food Animal Concerns Trust or FACT is a national nonprofit organization that's headquartered in Illinois. We promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a variety of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. You're invited to visit our website to learn more about our other farmer services, including the full roster of webinars we have coming up this winter. At this time, I'm very pleased to introduce our two wonderful presenters. First up, we will hear from Samantha Gasson of Bull City Farm, which is located in North Carolina. And she'll be followed by Anna Skemp of Deep Roots Community Farm, which is in Wisconsin. So both Sam and Anna are former Fund a Farmer grant recipients from FACT, and both have years of experience running educational camps for young people on their farms. We are very lucky to have them with us today to share their insights about running successful on-farm camps for children. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Samantha so that she may begin her presentation. Sam, please take it away. Thanks, Larissa. Um, welcome, everybody, to um, I was at a fun with planning ahead for farm camps for kids. Um, I'm excited that Larissa invited me to join and give you some of the things that I have done on our farm. Um, so we are in Rougemont, North Carolina, which is in the northern part of Durham County, which is in the Piedmont of North Carolina. And we are part of the Research Triangle area. So we are. Um, part of Chapel, uh, the research triangle is Chapel Hill, Raleigh, and Durham. So just to give you, if, you, if anybody knows that area, we're really close to Duke University in Durham. Um, about us, we're family owned. Uh, it's just my husband and myself and my kids, and we have a couple of employees seasonally. We, like I said, we're located in the research triangle of North Carolina, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area. We have a pretty large population within those three um, cities, and all three of those cities are within really um, accessible driving distance uh, from our farm and to our farm. We have three major universities. We have NC State, and we have the University of Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and then we have five minor universities, which sounds sort of mean saying they're minor universities, but smaller universities, not that they're minor in any way. We also have three large healthcare systems, um, and I don't even know how many hospitals and all that kind of stuff. We also have um, the Research Triangle, which has uh, 336 companies associated with it. Most of them are research and technology based. And Durham also has the Research Triangle Institute. Um, so our population is very educated and um, very, and we're also sort of a foodie area, Durham is especially. So it's a great place to have a farm and it's a great place to offer any sort of educational opportunities for adults or for children. We've just got the population. So I know I'm speaking from that point and uh, that place. And so I know there's, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, this none of this <laughs> may apply to you, but for me, this is, this is what has worked for me. And that's sort of where I want to go um, with this. And especially now that I've seen what the poll, um, the, the results from the poll, it sounds like a lot of you are just starting out thinking about summer camp. So I'm going to sort of approach it from that way. And I think Anna's going to go a little bit more into programming and stuff like that um, in her area. So we are a working farm. Uh, here are our farm products. Um, you can see we do lamb, we do pork, we do a lot of value added products, including sausages and, and cured products. And we're getting ready to start with uh, dog treats here pretty soon. We do turkey year round, um, mostly for Thanksgiving, but we also do cuts year round and we do eggs. We also do adult classes a couple of times a year. And I'm actually looking forward to uh, PEX webinar in a couple of weeks, which is a, uh, adult camp or I can't remember what it's called, but whatever that, that, that uh, next one is. So I can maybe develop my adult classes a little bit more. Um, I've sort of focused on the, on the camps and haven't done much with adults, mainly because adults are scarier than kids. Kids are fabulous. Anyway, so um, 
moving straight into how we do our summer camps and when you're thinking about starting camps, the best way to um, to sort of structure how you want to do your camp. So I'm going to do that sort of how the sort of the eras that I made when I first started doing camps. I started doing camps about 20 years ago, um, maybe even longer than that, uh, with mainly because my eldest child, uh, we lived way out in the country and she wanted to see more people in the summer and summer camps are really expensive. So instead of sending her to summer camps, I created summer camps for her and brought all of her friends. And that quickly evolved into friends of friends of friends of friends of people I didn't know. And then I really started charging money so that they could come. And I start out every year year looking at my local school system. So we are a relatively small county. We're an urban county and we're surrounded by urban counties. So I look at all the surrounding counties. I look at their school system. I see when they start, when their first day of camp start, oh, sorry, when their last day of school is and when their first day of school is. And from that, I decide how many camps I'm going to do and how many camps I'm going to do that summer. We've done as many as five and as few as one. Um, and we don't do camps all summer long because we're, we get really hot towards the end of July and it's hard to have outdoor camps unless you've got access to water. Um, and uh, so I end up, we stop sort of the, the end of July. We do, um, our camps are structured so that we don't have a huge amount of kids per camp. We do about 20 kids per camp, sometimes upwards of 40, depending on how many, uh, which camp it is. We've got one camp we've been doing for a really long time. So we have 40 kids for that camp, but uh, the rest of the camps are 20 kids. And I try to do a five to one ratio with my camp counselors to my kids, or sorry, five kids to every camp counselor. Um, you may want to think about whether or not you want to do intercession camps. I don't know if that's sort of a, a term that everybody uses, but uh, in our area, we do year round. Um, we have a year round schedule for schools and we also have a traditional schedule for schools. The year round schedules, as the year round kids have three intercessions, which are three weeks long sc scattered throughout the year. And the, I know a lot of people who are doing intercession camps. We do not. Um, let me see. Okay. The way we structure our camp and the way we sort of originally thought about our camps and how we want them to look. Um, we, I basically just did how many days, how many hours I could tolerate having that many people at my farm. That sounds terrible, but that is a good place to start because you don't want to start getting grouchy. So six hours for me is about my limit. I'm about ready for them to go at three o'clock. So we do from nine to three. We do an after camp for a fee. We do not do before camp because I don't want to get up that early to do a before camp care. So they, the earliest they can arrive is nine o'clock. Um, we only do a day camp because I don't think I could do a night, an overnight camp, but I know a lot of people who do, and they're very successful with that, especially if they have some cabins and that kind of thing, or if they want to do actually camping trips with the kids and take kids places. I don't want to do that, but I'm, I, I know people who have been very successful with that. Um, we have a very structured day, sort of, um, we have a when the kids come, they know what the day is going to look like, no matter what week of camp they come. So we have different themes for each week of camp. Um, I feel like that gives parents the, I guess it gives them the flexibility or it gives them the permission to send the kids to camp for multiple weeks because we do something different each week. But we do keep the structure very much the same. So we start out the day. Um, you know, with a sort of a morning meeting kind of thing. And then we go to feed the animals and then we do lunch and then we do, um, we go back out with the animals some more and then we do an afternoon activity and, and all the camps are like that every day. And that sounds like it, you know, I think when I first started doing camps, it was much more, okay, these kids are going to come out. They've got such structured lives. They're going to come out and be free. And it just ends up being a little bit chaotic. So you do need to put some thought into um, how your day is going to run and how and, and try and keep it as smooth as possible, especially when you get more than, you know, a couple of kids. Um, we do the we do the themed camps. We have a cow camp and we do a story camp and we do how to train a farm animal. We've got teen camp. We've got uh, a mini camp. We've got and we've had like fun and farm, fun and games on the farm. We've had all different kinds of themes. 
Um, and it's pretty much whatever the camp counselors and I want to do that year is what we end up doing. But we try, like I said, it really encourages kids to come to multiple camps that way. Um, and we do find that a lot of our ca- or a lot of our kids come to at least uh, two, or sometimes even all of the camps we have that summer. And I think that's only because they're themed. Um, if they, um, I, I, I just think it just gives parents, it makes parents feel okay with the amount of money they're spending, that they're not, they're not doing the same thing each week. And when you're thinking about um, the ages you're comfortable with, I know when I started 20 years ago, um, I've never done under five. Um, five years has always been my cutoff because I do want kids that are used to some sort of structure and are used to have the maturity to go to school, whether they go to school or not, if they're homeschooled, it's fine. But do they have that maturity level that's expected of a kindergartner? Um, I need them to be able to listen to me because we have a lot of, we have large animals. We have cows, we have pigs, we have, you know, we have a lot of things that could hurt them. We have horses. Um, so I, we we do a, we talk a lot about safety and um, uh, what the kids need to do to be kind and respectful to the animals as well. So when I first started out, I really focused on elementary school kids. But as my kids got older, I got more comfortable with older kids. And even though I'd been tutoring for years, um, you know, um, high school kids, I hadn't really ever um, put them with, you know, into, I hadn't really sort of integrated them into my summer camp program. I do now, but it's sort of as my kids got older, my my ability to, to be comfortable with uh, different ages of kids also got wider. So we do five to 18 and we do all the kids together. I love that sort of Montessori kind of um, and Wardorf kind of idea where older kids are helping younger kids and younger kids are learning from older kids. And it's worked out really, really well for us. I, I really like having those older kids um, as well as the younger kids. We keep a pretty, like I think I said before, we do five kids per counselor. I do junior counselors and then I have senior counselors and then I have full blown sort of adult counselors. Um, the junior counselors, I sort of, I'll sneak in a couple more kids if I can, if I've got a, if I've got a junior counselor I trust, so I might do eight to one and a half counselors, I guess, poor junior counselors. Um, But this little girl right here on the left, she has been coming to camp since she was six. And now she's a junior counselor. And that was a very big accomplishment for her. And And a lot of kids who've been coming since they were younger, they've looked up to these junior counselors and have counted down the days till they're 13, and they can become a junior counselor. And we we have a program with that. And um, we do offer a, a, a discount but it's on a per kid basis and it's based on how they performed the year before as a counselor. So I do that on an individual basis and I do that with the parents. Tuition and fees, um, we're able to charge a little bit more probably than other parts of the country. I, we charge, this year we're at 280 per week and all of our camps are by week. Um, we could do more. I know other camps in the area that are that are sort of farm based or or more you know vet based or or that sort of working with animals kind of thing. They're more like 300, 310 a week. I don't like the idea of. I mean, I want to make as much money as possible because why else would you? <laughs> have all these kids out to your house if you don't want to try and make some money. But I I also don't want to price out the kids whose parents don't work at Duke and, you know, have, you know, two full incomes from their parents. I don't want to price out kids. And because of that, I also offer a scholarship for every camp. So, and, and that sort of transfers. So if my first camp of the year, I don't have anybody using that scholarship, then I will, I will use, that goes into the next camp. So then I'll offer two scholarships for the next camp. So as many camps as I have that summer, as many weeks of camps I have that summer, I have that many scholarship spots that I'm, I'm willing to put, to, you know, sort of spread out over all the camps. And that way, I, that sort of makes me feel like I can allow kids, have kids come out who um, are not, Uh, paying necessarily the full fee. And I offer discounts as well for siblings and I offer discounts for multi-camps. So if you do multiple camps, you get um, a $20 discount per camp and the same with siblings, they get a $20 discount. And then like I said, we do the scholarship, one scholarship per camp. Um, I I really think a lot of, I think when you first start thinking about being, um, 
you're as a farmer thinking about expanding into summer camps. Look, we sort of started out the other way. We had summer camps that sort of supported our farm and helped our farm get started. So the summer camps were the majority of our income for the the farm before it was really even a farm. It was more of a hobby. And um, now that's totally switched and uh, we, we get, we earn far more from our farm products than we do our camps and the camps we just keep because I've got these kids who've been coming to camp forever and they're wonderful and I don't want to make them sad. So that's mainly why I do camp anymore. Um, but I do think it's important as a farmer not to, if you're not comfortable with children and you're not comfortable um, educating children, then yeah, the I think the instinct is to go ahead and want to hire a bunch of people to do it for you, but it's your farm. You need to be involved and you need to sort of set the tone of what the camp is going to be. And if you're not will, if that's not something you're comfortable doing, then probably summer camps are not the right choice for your farm. Because I've seen so many farms try to do it, they, either they're not comfortable. Um, with kids or they're the spouse of the of the person who is comfortable with, with the farm animals and they're not comfortable with farm animals and it just doesn't work as well and they don't end up being successful long term. Um, this is actually my eldest daughter. So I, I, when I hire people, I hire people who think the same way I do. I hire counselors who um, enjoy children and enjoy animals. And I pay them. I pay them a lot of money. So my senior counselors get $35 an hour and my sort of next tier down, the, the sort of helpers or they're not junior counselors, but they're they're counselors, but they're not the in charge counselors. I don't know why I can't think of a good term, for that, but I see I hope you see what I'm saying. Um, I charge the, I, I pay them $25 an hour. And the reason why I pay as much as I do is because I'm asking these college students and older high school students to not take a full time job somewhere else and just to work a few weeks out of the summer for me. And in order to do that, I have to be able to offer them um, the kind of money they would be making if they were working, you know, a twelve dollar an hour job, um, but more having but having more hours. So that's worked out well for me so far. Um, hopefully it won't become a problem in the future, but um, I, I, I charge enough and I have enough kids and um, it's worth paying for good help. I also think when you're doing your farm and your camp, the tendency is to um, keep them as separate things, but they can really benefit one another. The farm can help feed the camp and make sure your camps get filled, and then your camp can also help sell your farm products. So, But in order for that to work together, you need to have a brand that, you're, that is your farm. And um, this is our, this is one of my favorite kids, and this is uh, the uh, logo for our farm. So for the camp kids, uh, all of my camp uh, uh, pamphlets and all of that stuff has the farm logo on it, and the kids get T-shirts with the farm logo on it. Um, so I think it's important to keep your brand. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, good. Larissa didn't want to do that for a little bit, but it went. It did it. Yay. Okay. So protecting your farm. I think this is the most important thing you can do. Um, don't think you can have just a couple of kids out to your, you know, 10 kids out to your farm and not research permits and make sure you've got insurance and make sure you've got liability waivers. I mean, it's fine, I guess, if it's a bunch of friends or something, but if you're going to start inviting people out to your farm, you need to make sure you're protecting yourself and making sure you're take, protecting their children as well. The one thing I, when I, 20 years ago, uh, my county did not require a permit for summer camps or, or camps or after camp care or not after camp care, after school care or anything like that. In those 20 years, I haven't bothered to look into it. So I just found out that 10 years ago, they did start <laughs> requiring a permit. So I lucked out and didn't have to pay for my permit for nine years, but I got found out. So I had to pay for it. And it was $110. Wasn't happy about it, but um, this way um, I'm in compliance. But so I guess the moral to that story is, well, maybe the moral to that story is just don't double check because I just saved a whole bunch of money by not having to pay for the permit for nine years. But probably the better way to handle it is to keep checking because things change and uh, your county is going to change what their rules are and just keep up to date with everything. The other thing is um, make sure you have insurance. I just cannot say that enough because it's so easy for an accident to happen. And 
luckily, knock on wood, we have not had anything major happen. But, you know, kids get stepped on. I mean, we haven't even had any broken bones. We've been very lucky for as many years as we've done it. And with as many cows and as many kids and everything that's come through, we've been very lucky. But we're very, uh, we try to be very careful. We educate the kids. The kids know what the boundaries are. Um, they understand how to handle the animals. Um, but we do have insurance. Um, we went two years where we were not able to find anybody who would insure us. Um, but luckily to, um, sorry, but three years without insurance. And then two years ago, we were able to find somebody who would, and it's tied into our farm insurance. So it's working. It's great. It's really nice coverage. Um, the other thing we do is we do a liability waiver and I really lucked out. One of my campers parents, um, is um, a lawyer at the Land Loss Prevention Project, which is an organization, I think they're just for the Piedmont of North Carolina, but they may go outside of the state, I'm not sure. Um, and she came up with this for me for free. And that's what uh, the, their organization does. They offer um, services to farms. Usually it's uh, to help them prevent them from losing their farms. So it's foreclosure help and that kind of thing. But um, from uh, for me, though, I she looked at all the other stuff I had that I had everybody signing and she's like, I can make this so much easier for you. So she'd been coming to my camp for years or her kids have been coming to my camp for years. And you know, she has this attachment to the farm. So she's like, I can definitely come up with something good for you. So last year she came up with this and it's got four compart four parts to it. So it covers my media, my media release, medical release in case one of them gets hurt and I've taken to the hospital. And I also put in a biosecurity agreement um, just um, so they they realize that they need to be um, if they've worn their shoes somewhere else, they need to either get new shoes or clean those shoes really well before they come to the farm. And um, this is uh, this makes me sleep at night. If I didn't have this, I would have a hard time <laughs> sleeping. I feel like this is that extra little bit I need. Um, in addition to my insurance, and actually my insurance requires that I have a liability waiver. So um, just making sure I, I'm protecting myself as much as possible. One thing that North Carolina has, which is really, really nice, our Department of Ag has um, an agritourism law, which basically says, if you read through the whole thing, it says, if you go to a farm, farms are dangerous, and you know that when you step on the farm. So, so long as the farmer hasn't done anything dumb and put you in danger, um, you know that if you get kicked by a cow, you shouldn't have gotten that close to that cow. That's not exactly what it says, but basically that's what it says. So we have that added layer of security um, at, for any of our agritourism activities. So we post, part of it is you have to post this, um, this law so that everyone can read it if they want to. I actually require that my parents uh, sign and say that they have uh, they are aware of it and they've read it and they understand it. Uh, whether they have done any of those things is irrelevant. They check the box that says that they have. So that's all I care about. Um, and it, But I'd still have my own insurance. And that's what they the state does say. You know, this is not meant to uh, be instead of you having insurance. This is to help you if you do if you do get sued. Um, there's a lot. There's, there's lots of parts to it. It's very nice. We're very lucky to have that. Um, and I require, as far as the liability, I'm going to go back to the liability slide, this liability waiver, they have to sign this. It's not optional. Um, their kids cannot come to camp if they don't sign this liability waiver. And I've only ever had one parent tell me they didn't want to sign it. And I, I fill up my camp, so I don't need to make them happy. So this is, like, this is your requirement. You have to sign this stuff. If you don't, then your kids can't come to camp. And they signed it. So don't be afraid if somebody pushes back to feel like you can. You, you can't stand your ground because you need to, because you need to protect your farm. Um, and this is um, my second from last slide. Enjoy yourself. And it's, it's hard to think about that. I mean, you, it's a lot of work and they, and if you don't enjoy yourself, then it's just going to be a chore and you, you're self-employed, you work on your, you have your own farm and that's supposed to be the joy of it is you get to pick and choose the things that make you happy and make you make you glad you're doing what you're doing. And the kids are looking to you. A lot of these kids have never been on a farm before. They don't have relatives that are on farms. So it's more than just <clears throat> you enjoying yourself and you being, you know, presenting the farm as this wonderful place to be. You're also changing their minds and you're introducing them to farming and you're making them as adults 
think more kindly towards farming. At least you want them to be thinking that way. So when they're voting and they're making adult decisions about things that affect us as farmers, you want them to be thinking back to that wonderful experience they had on the farm and it not being such a foreign idea, farming being such a foreign idea. Anyway, so, and you don't want to do something you really don't enjoy. And the kids don't want to be around you if you don't, if you're not enjoying yourself. Um, and again, uh, this is my information. Um, there's my email. If you want to email me, feel free. Um, I'm usually pretty good about answering emails. Uh, and uh, my website is uh, bullcityfarm.com and all of our social media handles are at Bull City Farm. And we only do, we just do Facebook and Instagram. So that's it, Larissa. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. So we're going to handle most questions at the end, but we did have a couple questions come in. People were just wondering what, um, who you use for an insurance provider, if that's something you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, yeah, that's terrible. I have to, <laughs> I know that the name, it's a local company. I don't know who is actually carrying our insurance. I just know the insurance agency that we're working through. And I don't know if they go outside of North Carolina, but it's, um, Oh my gosh, I'm on the spot. So now I can't think of the name of it. Um, I will, once I get off, I'll look it up or I'll be able to think of it. Oh, High and Rubish. It's High and Rubish um, is the name of our insurance company. But like I said, I'm not sure who actually car carries our insurance. I don't know what company it is. Excellent. Um, Thank you. So just I just, uh, wanted to just have this disclaimer again that this presentation is not intended as legal advice. So please, if you are thinking about doing any of these kind of on-farm experiences that we recommend that you do consult with um, a, a professional legal advisor. Um, and on that note, I am going to turn the floor over to, to Anna Skemp with uh, Deep Roots Community Farm, who's going to uh, continue this presentation. Here you go, Anna. Hello from Wisconsin. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in this. Samantha, I um, am amazed by how many parallels, parallels there are in our stories. Um, that's pretty exciting how many things we've come up independently that are the same. So I am the owner and full-time operator of Deep Roots Community Farm in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And I am also a program director for Grow La Crosse, which is a nonprofit we helped start about eight years ago. And currently, all of our farm programming is run through this uh, nonprofit. So a little bit about me. Uh, I have a bachelor's in biology. I have a master's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. I studied animal behavior, um, in particular learning and insects and spiders. Uh, before I was a farmer, I was an elementary school teacher. I am uh, a mom of five kids. I am a graduate of the Land Stewardship Projects Farm Beginnings course, and I have been full-time on the farm now for 12 years. So our farm's mission statement is to produce food with integrity and to involve our community in that process. So our farm is located in the Driftless region of Wisconsin. The glaciers missed us, so we're not flat, and there are beautiful bluffs and valleys, and our home farm is nestled in one of those valleys. So the majority of our farm camps happen on this, uh, this home farm. We do have access to this larger private 1,100-acre um, family farm, and we do a lot of hiking there, and we just recently purchased an apple orchard. So we're really excited to expand farm programming there as well. Um, we could do what we do on less than five acres. Um, we tease that the only thing we can't live without is the streams that are on the property. Uh, we do offer somewhere between seven and eight weeks of farm camp every year, and cooling off in those streams is pretty key, especially in late July and into August. So in addition to the streams, we have a lot of pasture, hayland, we have a lot of woodland to hike through. Um, there's a native prairie planting and a pollinator habitat. So our market is La Crosse, Wisconsin. It's quite a bit smaller than the research triangle that Samantha operates in. Our population is about 60,000. Our average income in La Crosse is about 56,000. We have two hospitals and two universities, um, but we don't sell product to any of the larger cities like Madison or Minneapolis, and we're really not drawing um, kids for farm camp from those areas either. So this city is uh, very able to support us and what we do. 
Um, so I want to share with you a little bit about what we have on the farm. So we operate a horse boarding facility at any given time. We have about 25 horses on the farm. We're responsible for the daily care of them. We do have three horses that are really designated for farm camp, and they're very old and very gentle. They've been at it for about 10 years now. Um, we have a herd of 20 Angus cows. They're cows, calf, and May. And the herd is rotationally grazed, and we direct market grass-fed beef to our lacrosse community. We have a couple of old orchard sows. Um, they are pastured in the woods in the summer, and they do a great job of building nests and farrowing out in this natural habitat, and we get to enjoy about 15 piglets born during the farm camp weeks. We make a lot of hay on the farm. Um, to sustain our horses, cows, and pigs through the winter months. And the farm camp kids are very aware of sort of the daily process involved in that and how we make high quality hay for the animals. Uh, finally, we have a backyard flock of chickens and ducks. And last summer, we crowdfunded two baby cashmere goats to join our farm camp crew. So let's get into some of the details of our farm programming. So first of all, why do we offer farm camps? Um, we learned in our farm beginnings course that every farmer has an unfair advantage. So perhaps you have a business degree, perhaps you take amazing photos. One of our unfair advantages is that we're really close to a city. We're basically um, in the city, we're five miles away. Um, and it's very easy for us to get people out to our farm. So we take advantage of that. Um, we also feel that farm camps are a way for us to give back to the world. Um, similar to Samantha's story, it's something we can do with our kids and earn money. So our kids always participate in all the weeks of farm camp. It's something they do with their friends, their friends register, and they just really love it. Um, it's a good income stream on a small diversified farm. And Finally, one of the, sort of the unexpected benefits that we didn't anticipate when we started is that it would help us grow a very loyal customer base for our other products that we sell, including beef. So if people send kids to your farm, they want to support you in other ways too, and that's been really nice. So what do we do on a daily basis at Farm Camp? We sort of have five things that we try to touch on. We engage children in the real daily work of the farm, whatever that is, and it varies by season. Um, no project is required and there are always options. Um, we engage children in seed to table garden, gardening. So we have large perennial plantings, large annual gardens, and every child on the farm plants, tends, harvests, and taste tests from the garden. We demonstrate and encourage respectful interactions with animals. We provide curriculum related to environmental education. Um, so for example, uh, lessons on invasive species or pollination biology. And finally, we offer free time in nature. Um, kids these days, I feel like, are really scheduled from dawn until dusk. So we try every single day to give them time to simply be in nature without direction of what they have to do. Uh, so this is what I know. I know that kids want to spend the entire day with the animals. I know that a lot of parents who register their kids for camps want them to garden. And grant funders want um, things like seed to table gardening or building pollinator habitat or math and science curriculum to be delivered. And we try to balance all of these. So our farm programming is offered for children aged five to 18. Um, on occasion, we offer parent-child education for younger ones. So children younger than age five come to the farm with a parent or a grandparent or a caretaker. Um, for the past three years, the majority of our participants have been students at our local public schools. Um, over the years, we have enjoyed serving specific groups. Uh, so for example, we've had camps for boys, kids who attend the Boys and Girls Club, which is uh, typically provided to lower income families in our community. Uh, we've enjoyed hosting for English, English as a second language classes, and we've enjoyed having uh, kids out whose moms are at local women's shelters. So when we uh, started all of this, we wrote and received a couple of grants, and these allowed us to offer three years of camp basically for free, and it allowed us to figure out all the details and write curriculum. So that's how we got our foot in the door. 
um, we continue to um, offer free classes after the grant years were over. Um, we do this in collaboration with the school district of La Crosse. Um, so all the registration is handled through them. I co-teach in the summers with two public school teachers and the school district pays all of the teachers. I am additionally then um, paid a farm maintenance wage by um, Grow La Crosse, which is uh, the nonprofit we operate with. So that's essentially um, getting paid to create an environment on my farm that is conducive to farm camps. So I plant gardens, I provide animals, I mow, I keep everything looking tidy. Um, a couple of you in the registration questions asked about uh, linking curriculum to what you do. And so I just want to share these two uh, websites. So they're not state specific. They provide um, nationally accept accepted curriculum for science, math, and art curriculum. Anyone can access them. They're free and they're pretty great resources. So our school district camps are, um, we are linking a lot of, um, in particular, science and art curriculum. So in addition to the free sessions, uh, we do continue to offer fee-based sessions. So these are filled with kids who aren't in the, the school district of La Crosse or folks who couldn't get into the free classes or folks who want to do many weeks, basically. Um, so we do anywhere from three to five day sessions. Um, similar to Samantha, our, we're about done at three o'clock also. So we tend to have camps for somewhere between five and six hours a day. Um, we charge somewhere between 150 and 250 based on the number of days of the camp. Um, somewhere around $10 per child per hour. I feel like this is so dependent on where you live, however. So do your math, figure out what your expenses are, and then do comparables to see what other camps are charging. Um, this website is the registration platform that we use. It is for our fee-based camps. It is very efficient. Um, so all the participants are able to sign our liability waiver online. Um, they, and then um, when I'm ready for camp to begin, it creates a really handy um, like check-in list. And it also consolidates all my medical information and my emergency contact uh, information in a really nice way. So we've advertised uh, over the years the fee-based sessions. Um, we passed out flyers at local farmers markets. We rely on social media to spread the news about these. And um, we've also put a few ads in local parenting magazines, and that seems to be a pretty great place to reach the, the people that you're after. So as you're just getting started with farm camps, I encourage you to keep at it. Your audience will grow. Uh, we are able to fill all of our sessions, both free and fee-based, within about 15 minutes, and we have long waiting lists for both. Um, I saw some questions in the registration about climate change uh, curriculum, so I just really quickly wanted to share this resource. Um, I would highly recommend Drawdown. Um, it's a great book that basically quantifies, ranks, and prioritizes the top solutions to reduce emissions and sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. And as we all know, many of these solutions are related to agriculture, so things like um, rotational grazing, silver pasturing, composting, no-till methods. Uh, so we're really looking forward to incorporating that into our farm camp this summer. Um, similar to Samantha, we cap our sessions at about 20. Sometimes we go up to 24, and our ratio is somewhere between six and eight children per teacher. So I want to share a little bit about some of the lessons we've learned over the uh, 10 years we've been doing farm camps. So I highly recommend that you start small. So instead of filling your entire summer right away, uh, start with manageable sessions. So when we were first getting started, we did a lot of farm days. So kids come to your farm for like two to three hours. Uh, we used to do spring on the farm, autumn on the farm, winter on the farm, and offer a discount to register for all of them. Over the years, we have done a lot of field trips. We charge $6 per child for a two-hour field trip. And this is a great way to gauge interest um, in your community, build your audience. It's a great way for you to build your curriculum and your lessons and really decide if you like it or not. Um, another way to get kids out to your farm 
and build your audience to sign up for farm camps is to have basically skill days. So as farmers, we tend to have a lot of skills. We prune fruit trees, we shear sheep, we plant gardens, perhaps you knit or carve spoons. Uh, we happen to make a lot of art in our free time. So uh, it's pretty fun to charge kids to come uh, help you do projects on the farm and another way to get people to sign up for your farm camp. So we have had a tremendous experience with volunteer help um, because we've reached out to our community. So we have hosted so many um, internships and independent study students from the local colleges. Um, and those students have all have come from majors including biology, community health education, environmental studies, and education. There are others in the community that need and want volunteer opportunities. We've had um, a great time working with third year medical residents at one of our local hospitals. Senior groups often want um, volunteer experience. And more recently, we have begun supporting researchers, including uh, master's students and professors at the local university who are interested in some aspect of our farm camp, but also come and help and are an additional body um, on top of the three paid teachers. So I was at an educator conference once and um, the presenter was talking about background checks and he said background checks everyone when children are involved, even your grandma and you know everyone in the audience laughed and then it was silent. He's like, no guys, seriously, background check your grandma. So the point here is um, dot your I's, cross your T's, background check every single person that is going to have contact uh, with kids. So protecting your assets, um, run your plans by a good attorney. We first got started um, launching our business, launching our nonprofit, working through our liability waiver. Um, we worked a lot with the small business development program at our local university. They offered a lot of free advice. That was a great resource for us. Um, get a good insurance policy. And I think it's really important to tell your agent exactly what you want to do. On top of um, the insurance policy, get an umbrella policy. And my advice on insurance is to shop around, consider local companies, but also non-local ones who specialize in what you want to do. I don't have the name of our insurance provider in front of me right now, but I would be happy to follow up with that if anyone wants to send an email or connect with me afterwards. Um, so instead of a blanket form, I think it's really important to tailor the risk specifically to your situation and be really honest about what goes on on the farm so that it's a good solid liability waiver that holds up. Uh, similar to North Carolina, Wisconsin has a recreational immunity statute which provides an additional layer on top of your liability waiver on top of your insurance policy. So definitely check into things like that for your state. Um, like North Carolina, you also have to have a sign visibly posted that acknowledges that. So when I first started, um, I think it's easy to let the fears of um, liability paralyze you and get in the way of moving ahead. Um, but I think it's really important to trust the world, trust that you have something good to give to the world um, and move ahead, but just be really smart about what you do. So know your animals, for example, very, very well. I would never get to know a new animal with kids, for example. Um, for us, some animals are best observed instead of touched. So we never, for example, go into the cow pastures or go into the uh, pig pastures. I think it's important to be flexible, um, to respect animals' temperaments and pay attention to variable conditions. Um, just one example, horses on really windy days tend to be just a little bit jumpy. So instead of working with horses, every single day at the same time. If it's a windy day, we might skip the horses that day and we explain to the kids who might be disappointed why that's the right decision and why it's a respectful decision. Um, we always run first and animal second, so kids have so much energy and our animal work tends to happen after we've run, after we've played a game, after we've hiked or played in the creek and the kids are grounded and settled and uh, ready to be present with the animals in a respectful way. So just a quick list of things you should be aware of. Um, be aware of mandatory reporter laws for child abuse and neglect. 
be aware of medical histories that require attention and make sure that you can handle those. Know how to safely deal with bloodborne pathogens. Um, at some point, someone will get a bloody nose and you need to keep yourself and the other kids safe. Know how to do CPR and other first aid. Know how to use an EpiPen. Um, and then make an emergency plan so that if you ever had to deal with a lost child or severe weather or an injury, you know what to do. and You don't have to think on your feet in a scary situation. Uh, we have also been very lucky over the 10 years to uh, ever have anything worse than a bloody nose. So despite everything that has to be figured out, um, I absolutely love farm camps. They are my favorite thing that we do. We've had thousands of kids on the farm over the years, and I hope we continue it for decades to come. Uh, so because FACT is a nonprofit focused on animal care, I want to give just a couple of details on what we do. So on a daily basis, we feed, water, clean animal housing, and groom animals. We also do a lot of observation, and we teach a lot of science curriculum through animals. Um, we ask children regularly, what can we do to improve the quality of these animal lives? And we work together to implement these changes. So, uh, for example, our Fund a Farmer grant allowed us to put uh, scratching posts in our cow pastures uh, for the cows to rub on, and students with, uh, worked with us to help install those. Uh, we've created mud wallows in the pink summer pastures. We've added branches over the chickens' feeding area so they feel safer from aerial uh, predators. And I continually challenge the kids to put themselves in the animal's shoes and imagine uh, what it would feel like to be that animal. And I hope that we're developing empathy of all types through these interactions. Uh, we also love collecting data during our farm camps. I am a scientist at heart, and it really is such a simple, fun task to teach. Um, and data collection is a great way to tell if we've truly made a difference in the animal's lives. So, uh, for example, we might monitor uh, chicken behavior before and after the branches were installed um, over their feeding area and record the number of times the chickens um, spooked and fled once a shadow passed overhead, for example. And it's really neat for the kids to be able to see that they've actually uh, done something that makes a difference. Um, and then I just want to touch on this one final time. Um, the benefits of farm camp are many. So I feel like you're able to make a tremendous difference in these kids' lives. It's a delightful way to spend your summer days. And again, if you have other things on your farm that you want to sell for us, we sell uh, meat. It is such a loyal customer base. So if kids love coming to your farm, they love your farm camp, those parents are going to buy your products uh, very religiously. So that's been a great secondary benefit for us. Uh, please, please reach out to me. I am happy to help in any way and answer questions. We got so much help when uh, we were first getting started, and I would love to return that favor. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anna. That was wonderful. Um, so much really awesome information. And yeah, thanks for the thumbs up that are <laughs> coming across the screen. We do have um, several minutes to take your questions. I know some have come in, so I'm going to go scroll back through and see what we can answer. Um, so a couple questions I'm going to summarize. People are asking, um, what do you do about lunch? And then kind of all the logistics of what do you you know, in addition to the food aspect, do you have um, your campers bring certain things with you or not bring things with them like phones and such? So I'm gonna, uh, I'll give it to Sam first if you wanna tackle that. Sure, so I, everybody has to bring their own food. Um, I just don't wanna have to worry about allergies or anything like that. So they uh, bring their own lunch and they also um, bring their morning snack. We do offer an afternoon snack, but it's pretty much, you know, like watermelon or something like that, that nobody's going to be allergic to. Um, and I, when I, when we do our data, or when we do our um, camp sign up, we also ask for a list of allergies and um, that sort of thing. Um, and then as, what was the other question? It was lunch and what else? 
Um, just other things that you have uh, them bring or not bring. And I'm also going to add in there, what do you do about bathrooms? Because that's come up a couple times as well. So uh, you, uh, you asked about cell phones. So we do not allow cell phones. Um, when the kids get picked up, if their parents want to take them out and they want to take pictures, so they can bring cameras if they want to, but they're not allowed to bring cell They can bring cell phones, but they're not allowed to pull them out. Um, because our kids, uh, we have a lot of elementary school kids, but we also have a lot of teenagers as well. And that's the first thing I want to do is whip out their phone. And it's just just discourage them from doing that. Um, also, I don't want them to drop it in a, you know, a hog wallow or have somebody, somebody grab it from them and then be held responsible for their phones. Um, and as far as the bathroom goes, we're able to uh, uh, shut off part of our house. And so we give access to the bathroom that's in that part of the house that we can shut off. Anna, would you like to add to that at all? Sure. So we also um, ask kids to bring their own snack and lunch. We provide cold water. Um, we do ask for nut-free lunches. Inevitably, there's at least one child with a nut allergy that we have registered, so we try to avoid that uh, completely. Um, we are a completely screen-free camp as well. Um, we offer a porta pot We say it builds character. Um, and then another thing that was kind of fun to us over the years is we're an organic farm and like we never use deep based bug spray, but um, parents have this perception that, you know, the farm is absolutely clean, uh, teeming with ticks and mosquitoes and everything else. So we would have these parents show up to our organic farm yeah. their kids with deep based sprays. And I, I actually get a rash from deep, so I would like, oh my goodness. So we have um, started including that um, mm -hmm. in our registration materials. You know, please apply your, uh, your 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 insect spray at home, or consider some of these alternatives that um, probably work just as well. So that's another lesson that we've learned over the years. Um, we encourage uh, sun hats and sunscreen as well. Absolutely. So we do we do the same thing. Um, I yeah I have I ask the parents to give me permissions if their child has to take a, any sort of medication or anything like that. I get written permission from the parents to be able to do that, and and I include sunscreen in that because um, you know there's a lot of kids with allergies, and we don't mention bug spray. I don't even have any bug spray on the property. Uh, I, we don't use bug spray, so <laughs> like if they want to do it, then they have to deal with it on their own. Um. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to turn this question over to Anna because I know you, you spoke about it, but someone's wondering if you could recommend a way to do um, the background checks. How do you do that? Um, part of, uh, I, I don't actually handle that directly. It is all run through our, our nonprofit and our executive director does that for us. So one mm -hmm. of the lovely pieces of operating within a nonprofit is you get to teach instead of handle uh, paper, paperwork. So I don't have that answer. I could certainly follow up with her and provide that uh, information though. Excellent. Um, so one other question that's come up a couple times, uh, people are wondering what do you do about weather, um, shelters or um, you know emergency kind of like weather situations, what do you provide for your campers? I'll go back to Sam for that one. So we have um, a, a really large pole barn that we can go under. And so we, um, and we have some other sort of lean tos that we can use, but um, we, if we know what the weather is going to be like, then we will, if it's, it's going to be stormy or anything like that, then we do go under the pole barn. If we've got um, some really severe weather, then I bring everybody in the house. How about you, Anna, any insight? Yeah, so we have an old milking parlor on our farm and it's like an insulated building. It's not huge, but we have tables and chairs in there and we go inside for our projects. Um, we also collect a list of emergency weather numbers at the start of every week. So you can text parents um, if there's going to be like really severe weather with uh, climate change, we're having crazy events like 500 year floods in our area. So if it looks like something like that is very likely to happen, we would send out a text the night before um, canceling camp. And I believe we've only had to do that once. And then we'll still show up just in case, you know, the one or two kids happen to show up. Right, right. 
So let's see, we're just about out of time. I'm, I'm going to pick one last question. And I, I'm sorry if we didn't, don't get to all the questions. Um, we will provide follow-up links in the, in the email, links to the recording and to the slides and to the um, presenters' websites and all that, all that jazz. Um, I guess someone else, we'll just leave it with, um, someone's wondering how best to figure out how to price these. And I know we talked a little bit about um, the camps. They're looking actually to do more of a homeschooling kind of um, sessions, but how would you go about kind of finding that information or developing that um, uh, kind of schedule of pricing? Um, how about for Anna, if you'd like to chat just about that for a moment. So I think it's really important as farmers that we really fully understand our expenses and charge a fair price for our products. Um, it's easy to get into thinking, oh, I just need this to fill. I just need to sell my beef. I'm just going to price it too low so people buy it. And um, people are willing to pay a fair price for a good service, and we've learned this over and over again. So I think the first thing to do is to do a business plan and carefully list all of your expenses and make sure that you're getting paid a living wage for the hours that you're putting into the camp um, after your expenses. And, you know, always bump it up a little bit. We, uh, that's one of the best lesson, lessons we've learned over the years. Um, so do your business plan, compare it to other farms, and then charge a little bit more and do a great job of it, and people will sign up for it. Um, I actually, uh, uh, this is Samantha, um, I, I think is so right. I think as farmers, we tend to, um, and I think self-employed people in general tend to underprice themselves or under undervalue their, what they're offering. Um, I actually homeschooled my kids. So I've had a lot of homeschooling groups come through and I charge them exactly what I charge people who are not homeschooling because, I, but the one rule I do have is that no parents can come with them because that's <laughs> homeschoolers they all want to come together and I say that as I homeschooled my, um, <laughs> my children all the way through so I can say that we're like that but um that was always my role is you drop the kids off you leave and then I charge them exactly what I charge everybody else excellent um and so yeah for that person in the audience they might they might it might be great for them to follow up with you, Sam, about some of the logistics involved. Yeah, any um, questions that weren't answered, and um, feel free to email me, and or, or I'm sure Anne is the same way. <laughs> There's, you guys are wonderful. Um, so let me just have a, share a couple of housekeeping items before folks uh, drop off the line. As a reminder, immediately after this webinar, there is a very brief survey, and we would all really greatly appreciate it if you take it take a minute. It really will only take about 30 seconds to a minute to tell us about your experience. Like I said, a recording of the of the slides and the recording um, will be available soon. I'll be sending out an email, um, hopefully later today with that information. And as well, we always archive all that, inf all that on our website. A reminder that we do have heaps of webinars coming up this winter, including one in two weeks, which will dive into how to offer educational events for adults, which um, Sam mentioned at the beginning, um, and which I think is a really nice complement to today's session because there'll be some overlap and some different things to think about when you're doing educational programming um, on a farm-based uh, environment. Um, and then in February, we're really excited because we'll have grazing expert Sarah Flack with us to do a mini series on grazing management and pasture improvement. So I'll be sure to include links to the upcoming webinars in my follow up email as well. So um, I'm afraid that is all the time we have for the session today. I'd like to give a really wonderful thank you to Samantha and Anna for sharing and being here with us and really talking through kind of the logistics and the the, the behind the scenes information um, about offering camps on uh, farm camps for children um, and for taking the time to answer questions and being available for follow-up. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone out in the audience for your attention and your interest in this topic and being with us today. I hope that we'll see you on another webinar coming up soon. So in the meantime, have a very lovely afternoon and goodbye for now. Bye, everyone.